Welcome to the Wide World of Esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Today we're talking about esports law. My guest is attorney AJ Jamil. Welcome, AJ. Hey, Catherine. It's great to be here. Fantastic. Well, I understand you are you do 100% esports law. Yeah, I, I am. Uh, so I work for the uh, law firm ESG Law, and we are a 100% esports law firm. Uh, we represent uh, top talent from around the world. Uh, we represent uh, many of the teams in the uh, the LCS, the Overwatch League, and many other esports leagues. Um, and it's definitely been a fantastic experience to be able to work for them, and it's you know having a great time doing what I love. Fantastic, and. I actually am a member of the Esports Bar Association, and that's how I came to have you on my show. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting is you fairly recently graduated from law school. Is that right? Yeah, I did. I graduated last year in May uh, from Baylor Law School uh, based in Waco, Texas. Uh, and I'm currently living in Austin, Texas right now. Um, and, uh, you know, took the took the uh, the bar uh, last year and uh, got licensed in October and then uh, fortunate enough to have a job at uh, ESG and uh, been, been able to just really rock that experience. What's really kind of exciting about you and something very interesting is that you're one of the few attorneys probably in the United States who have only practiced esports law. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, like, like we were saying, um, we're com completely exclusively at yeah, esports. Um, and uh, just a, a helpful clarification piece is we also represent um, uh, the the teams of esports. Um, you know, we uh, we don't really represent uh, any of the players or talent um, because of the conflict of interest mm -hmm. issues. Uh, so you know, we're fully team side. Um, and uh, you know, what what's interesting is. Um, you know, being one of the few people that that uh, their only experience is on the esports side, um, you know, it's it's pretty cool. Like a lot of uh, a lot of the other um, esports lawyers in the space had to start out somewhere else, um, just because um, esports wasn't this huge thing. You know, just a few years ago, it's really this um, emerging industry. And uh, one of the things that I tried to recognize going into law school in um, 2016 is okay. Esports, it seems to be this thing that is, um, you know, really gaining a lot of momentum. Um, and where will it be in like 2019, uh, 2020, and, and beyond? Um, and, you know, I kind of had this idea where, well, I feel like they'll probably need lawyers. I feel like there will be, a, you know, a desperate need for esports counsel. Um, as as the years progress, as the industry develops, and and as as you can see, like it's uh, the industry is completely booming, and it's one of the um, uh, few entertainment industries that can really thrive in a in a quarantine environment. Uh, you know, we've been seeing more uh, esports, um, you, you know, on ESPN. We've been seeing more uh, esports just uh, online because you know the players compete from their from their home, uh, and you know people can watch it from their home. And, and you don't need to be in this physical space uh, to to actually make it so esports can continue. Although although there is um, plenty of arenas and stadiums that uh, are dedicated to esports, it's just one of those things that has been able to really thrive in this COVID environment. That's fantastic. And so I understand that your firm is a uh, uh, it you have um, uh, attorneys in different parts of the country. Uh, where where's your your attorneys located? Yeah, so we have six attorneys. Um, we've got uh, one located in Los Angeles, um, two located in the Seattle, Washington area, um, one in uh, Minnesota, uh, one in New York, and uh, I'm here in Austin, Texas. All right. You get to be the Texas guy. Sure, the Texas guy. <laughs> um, and so what issues um, it, uh, do you handle in your law practice? Because I understand that you represent the teams and you're more on that side. Um, just mm -hmm. like how in other areas, we have plaintiff's attorneys, we have defense attorneys. And, um, but so what kind of, with teams, what kind of issues would you encounter? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so just to take it from the top, uh, I'd say that, um, 
predominantly a lot of our workflow involves like different kinds of contracts. Um, so I, I'd say kind of first and foremost, I, I kind of identify as like a contracts attorney. Um, we do a ton of player contracts um, where we're negotiating with the player or their agent um, for different rights and uh, you know salaries. Um, and, but we'll also do things like uh, sponsorship and endorsement deals where we're uh, doing contracts with uh, different brands who are looking to make an impact in the in the esports uh, space. Um, you know, uh, a predominant issue that comes up in the esports environment is the intellectual property rights. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, the, the uh, esports industry is, um, you know, primarily governed by where these property rights land. Um, we have, uh, there's like likeness for the players, there is the media rights for the, uh, for the competitions. Uh, the piece that makes esports unique um, from traditional sports, as, as I will refer to it, um, is that uh, the intellectual property for the esports that are involved uh, are owned by a publisher. Uh, you know, the, um, no one owns football uh, or um, like the NFL doesn't own football, but uh, you know, a, a company like Riot will own a game like League of Legends or a company like Blizzard will own uh, Overwatch. Um, and that kind of adds the twist in this entire you know, body of esports law where uh, you, know, you have to also work with the publisher to make sure that um, we're complying with uh, the contracts that they set out. We're com uh, complying with their restrictions because ultimately the publisher does have uh, total control over their, their intellectual property uh, and they can you know, dictate a lot of what they want to do there. Um, so I know that was love. That that's kind of one slice of what we deal with is is the you know the contract side, the the esport competition uh, side, and, and the sponsorships. Um, but you know we'll also uh, do things um, like uh, we I mean we've got uh, an immigration practice as well because a lot of these um, uh, esports players they are from different countries um, that are looking to work in the United States as, and work and operate as a, as a player. Uh, so we'll, we'll work a lot with the teams to get um, these uh, these players visas. Um, typically, uh, you know, we'll one of the uh, predominant ones is we'll do like a P1A visa, uh, which is the same visa that um, athletes will use whenever they're trying to. Um, uh, come and live in the United States and work as a, you know, whatever kind of athlete that they are in uh, for, for their sport. Uh, we basically do that, use that exact same model, but for, for esports. Now, for the teams that you are representing, um, do where are the team members located? Are they in predominantly in the US or are like what countries would they be in? Yeah, so, I mean, they are all, they're really all over the place. Um, you know, we we have seen right now the uh, kind of predominant hub of esports players has typically been um, Los Angeles. Um, now, uh, and this this will get into another aspect of what we do at the firm, but like there are uh, very particular employment issues with um, working in California. It's the you know age old debate of employee versus independent contractor. Um, California has added a, a layer of complexity uh, to uh, allowing people to. Um, to work there that, you know, we, we have to prom prompts to figure out. Um, so, you know, we, we've seen a lot in lo the Los Angeles, California area, but that's, that's no longer um, predominantly being the case. We've got, uh, I mean, we'll see now um, players kind of all scattered throughout the, uh, the United States and even, even the world. Like we have uh, seen several cases where, you know, people will be international and and again because it's the esports environment where uh you know the services can be performed uh, remotely streaming can be performed um remotely you know you can play your competitions anywhere um they've got that flexibility to, to uh to set have their setup anywhere have you seen much litigation or alternative uh dispute resolution uh forums in esports to date or is it mostly contracts yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's, it, it is a, a lot of contracts. Like our firm does not um, specialize in any um, litigation like like that. But um, I would say that a lot of the issues, like we, we're following all the issues in esports uh, that relate to litigation um, because they are so important to how, like how we do business and how the esports industry monetizes. Um, 
And I would say the big issue that has been on the forefront of everyone's mind lately has been the um, the Tifu lawsuit uh, with uh, with Face Clan. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, one of the issues that in that lawsuit was. Um, regarding the uh, California Talent Agency Act, uh, where uh, different um, uh, organizations that are representing um, certain influencers and certain players uh, are required to have licensure uh, licensure under um, these talent agency laws. So there are, is uh, litigation that will follow from that. And, uh, you know, depending on how a lot of that resolves, it will affect uh, affect the business and it will affect esports in, in some way. Um, but um, you know that that's that's the thing with uh, with esports right now. The um, the industry is so nu- so new that we don't have answers to a lot of these questions. Mm-hmm. So Tifu lawsuit is still unresolved. Uh, it's it's still um, ongoing. Uh, we're following those updates uh, very closely to make sure that we're in the know and we're understanding how these things all uh, play out. And one issue with esports that I'm sure you have to deal with is minority because a lot um, minority in terms or minor. Um, uh, yeah. minor or in, not not um, uh, team members that don't have capacity yeah. to contract, right? So yeah. how does that play in where you have maybe a 16-year-old or 17-year-old that may not um, have capacity to enter a contract on their own? Yeah, that that's a great question as well. Um, you know, it's... Uh, Interesting. A lot of the best players uh, just happen to be minorities. Like who who would have figured that out? Um, it, you know, it seems like kind of a dream come true for like younger AJ being able to play in video games as, as a profession. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of these people, uh, a lot of these minors get to really relish and enjoy the dream of being, being able to play uh, video games. Um, but like, I think you mentioned the issue like spot on that um, introduces a layer of complexity with um, um, minor hiring laws. Um, and uh, what we'll typically see is there are, um, you know, around uh, three age groups that uh, are often implicated with these um, uh, minority issues. Um, you've got the 16, uh, 16 to 17 year olds, um, uh, 14, 15, and then 13 and below. Um, we've got a little bit of liberty with um, anyone that is above the age of 13, um, uh, but it is a super state-by-state state analysis. Um, each state law has uh, different ways that they uh, address uh, minority employment. Um, and uh, you know what, what tends to be um, quite favorable for minorities is whenever they're located in um, California, because in uh, California has a body of um, law because of the entertainment industry that allows um, minors to uh, work. It, it helps with the uh, the employment issues uh, for minors uh, there. Um, but, uh, you know, every now and then it would also come up where, you know, minors can have their disability of minor uh, of minority removed to allow them to, to contract. Um, because the, the general rule is if, if a minor is uh, trying to enter into a contract, um, they can typically re- uh, rescind it at any point that they want to um, because you know public policy dictates that we don't want to be taking advantage of minors we don't want them to um, you know be, be preyed upon by uh, big businesses uh, so it, it's a challenge it, it is a bit of a puzzle um, being able to navigate those um, those employment laws but it, it is certainly in demand it's certainly needed uh, and you know it, it ultimately all sends up from um, you know minors being the uh, some of the best game players right now and I'm sure that's uh, we're, that's what we're going to continue to see as the infrastructure from esports um, continues to get better and uh, the pastime can start being passed down from um, you know, generation to uh, generation, which uh, you, I mean, you haven't really been able to see before. So one of the things that um, also plays into the issue of the fact that esports is a extremely populated by young people is this mm-hmm. idea. Our our recent um, changes in betting laws, mm-hmm. and so have you uh, dealt with issues regarding betting yet? in your practice? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it comes up in, um, uh, in like ancillary capacities where, um, you know, it's not necessarily a situation of, um, you know, somebody wants to bet, um, you know, 50 bucks on who's going to win the next League of Legends match. Um, 
it, it more so comes up in the context of um, uh, games of skill versus games of chance. And um, a team wants to go, or a, um, a company will want to host a tournament. Um, and the game that they're playing for the tournament has elements of randomness. Um, and then the question becomes, if there are elements of randomness in this um, competition that this uh, company is organizing, like where's the line whenever that becomes um, crossed over from a game of skill to a game of chance? So, uh, I mean, we've done a, a few um, uh, like evaluations on what where that kind of line falls. Um, I mean, we're it, it's still all super new and. Um, the interesting thing too is like legislation doesn't account for this stuff like it, it, it's you know it the things that they're that a lot of companies are doing make sense it um it, it's not anything that is like predatory or really um uh, has anything to do with like really gambling in the sense that we would uh, think of it as um but uh the law it's just a classic case of the law um hasn't caught up to where uh, technology is um so it's something that uh you know we, we try to stay vigilant about um but uh there's only so much of a gray area that, that we can operate with you know it's tough to have a conversation about esports law because it's so new and mm -hmm. um what you're you you are always drawing on law in other uh areas and yeah so, you know, you are mentioning that it doesn't have that much precedence or or mm -hmm. that or there isn't much you have to look at entertainment law in other areas is pretty normal in esports law. And one thing that I would mention is that I understand the esports um, bar association is fairly new too. Have you mm -hmm. been a member since the beginning? Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the um, things that I attribute to um, uh, getting a job at ESG Law after law school is, um, you know, I tried to keep my eye on what was going on with the industry as a law student. Um, and I saw that, you know, a lot of the uh, big attorneys that were practicing uh, in the space had uh, developed the Esports Bar Association. Um, and one of the really cool things about that organization is it was open to uh, law students. Um, and I was like naturally super compelled to join. I'm like, hey, if this is a great opportunity for law students, let me, uh, you know, let me join the organization and, and start learning from, you know, some of the, the best and brightest minds in the industry. Um, and uh, it, the Esports Bar Association, I think that's where it really differs than uh, from a lot of other organizations. Um, one, because students can get involved, and two, we can really shape where the industry goes because of because of it. It's like one of the first opportunities for um, all the uh, the legal um, the legal minds and attorneys that are working and shaping the space to get together and talk about where we want the space to go, and then we have an opportunity to like uh, to to do it and actually execute on that. Um, and, and I do want to add, it is, is very much an organization that um, you get out of it what you put into it. Uh, mm -hmm. at, the, at the very start, um, I just started you know, taking on more responsibilities, more tasks, joined the different committees that were, were offered. Uh, now, like I do a lot of, um, a lot of tax, tasks throughout the Esports Bar Association just overall, uh, but, it, but it very much started with uh, what were the problems that, need to be, that needed to be addressed with this or, like, organization? Like what, what were the needs? What were the things that they needed taken care of? Uh, and then I would just do it. I would just step up and just do it. And then um, uh, you know, one thing led to another. Uh, it, was, it, it became, AJ, you were the guy that was doing this other, this other thing, um, we'd like you to take on this additional responsibility. Uh, um, this other thing just kind of snowballed. Um, but the critical piece to that is, uh, I think it demonstrated that uh, I could I could get the job done and and like really um, you know where my talents and skills were because uh, that's not always an opportunity you'll get uh, with um, with the bar association or even an opportunity you'll get um, just uh, as a student. Uh, so. You know, I, I always recommend to uh, law students that uh, if they're really trying to break into the space, the number one thing is to uh, get involved with the industry and the esports bar association is one of the uh, the best ways to do it. Um, but then it's it's not just join the or just join the organization and just put it on your resume. It's join the organization and then start doing the things to demonstrate why you're a valuable member and why you're gonna really be a, a game changer in the industry. Now you're motivating me to get involved. <laughs> I, I've, I've been a member for about three months and I did have to apply to be a member and I got yeah. accepted. And uh, so I'm excited to be a member. I just need to get involved. 
Um, we do have a question from a viewer yeah. and it is, does your company branch out to help streamers on YouTube and Twitch who play video games for a living or do you focus mostly on competitive gaming? Yeah, so we do do um, uh, like contracts with um, uh, street, like streamers and content creators and influencers, people who will um, stream on Twitch or YouTube or whatever. Um, the trouble is um, we typically don't represent the individual streamers or um, uh, talent um, just because we represent so many of the teams in the industry that uh, it becomes a conflict of interest. Um, but uh, if, uh, if there is anybody that needs help and they just need a starting point for representation, uh, it's absolutely something we can uh, help them out and we can help them find the right people to um, help them out with whatever their needs might be. Terrific. Um now, I understand that you have a very unique background in esports. Why don't you tell us about what you did in esports before you became an esports attorney? Yeah. So, uh, one of my uh, favorite things um, before I decided to enter the legal career and uh, go down the path of being a lawyer was uh, I worked at the video game company, uh, Blizzard Entertainment, and I, and I worked there for seven years. Um, I got a job uh, while I was working at, um, or excuse me, while I was uh, attending uh, undergrad at um, uh, UT Austin. Um, and uh, I had loved the job so much that after I graduated, I stuck with it. Um, and I had worked my worked my way up. I uh, ultimately ended up as a senior game master at uh, at Blizzard. And then the choice um, kind of presented itself to me was, all right, what's the um, kind of what's the next step in in my career? Kind of where do I want to go from here? Um, and uh, you know, then I had always wanted to go to law school. That was always um, the initial thing that was like. When I was a kid, like, hey, go, go to law school, go to law school. Um, but it was so hard for me to kind of divorce myself from a job that I had loved so much and had given me so much of my identity. Um, you know, it, it was tough to, to do that. Um, but I had told myself that if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to take this plunge, leave, leave Blizzard, uh, I'm going to continue in the legal path for a, something that I care about, something that I can be really passionate about. Um, and, and that's what I did. I stuck with um, wanting to do esports. I, I remember, um, you know, very vividly my uh, uh, being in my career development office for my law school and them uh, asking me what I wanted to do. And I was like, esports law. Like, I, I, I know exactly what I want. I know exactly... Um, you know what uh you know what i think it would take to get there um but i, I kind of had my goals uh you know pretty pretty defined from from the start um but uh one of the things i i do think that really helped me uh, make that transition smooth was um i had stayed plugged in to like all the in industry events uh i actually met my uh my current uh, supervisor my direct supervisor right now at um at blizzcon in uh 2015 when i was there as an employee and he had told me that uh, he was an esports attorney, and that kind of got the gears turning a little bit. I was like, okay, I guess, I guess you know, this this might be possible. Uh, and then it was a matter of just keeping up the um, the network, uh, staying plugged in with everybody, um, and uh, you know, keeping uh, keeping my contacts like uh, warm contacts, so to speak. Um, it wasn't just um, you know make the connections and then just let it sit in my phone or you know, social media for whatever. It's like reaching out, uh, keeping the conversation going, uh, being like, hey, this thing that just happened in uh, industry news is kind of interesting. Like, wh what do you think about it? Um, mm -hmm. And then that that made it uh, transition pretty smoothly to the Esports Bar Association. I'm like, okay, I think this this is the next step. Um, and, you know, the, the, rest is, uh, the rest is history. Yeah, I can't even, I can't even imagine if a person like, an attorney or a, well, a law student or a college student has a meeting with a, a counselor and they yeah. say, I want to be an esports lawyer or I want to go into esports, you know, a year or two ago. That seems like they would <laughs> laugh at that or think it was weird or something like that. But now I think it's changed. Don't you think mm -hmm. that that the the um, industry has grown so much? that there's, especially with COVID even, yeah. it seems like there's even more legitimacy in all aspects of esports. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you see more and more every day, like obviously there's a ton of money in esports and that's been shown like time and time again, uh, but uh, the some of the names that are tied to it, some of the brands that are tied to it, um, 
And then even the infrastructure, it seems like, um, you know, on a pretty regular basis, there, there'd always be uh, a new stadium or a new arena or, or something, some kind of new business idea centered around esports that uh, that would come up. Um, and one thing that I find um, quite fascinating is, um, uh, you know, I've looked at the, the numbers for um, the median age of a traditional sports fan across um, all sorts of different sports. Um, and that age continues to go up year after year after year. Mm. Uh, the one thing that is staying low and is, is going down really is, uh, is esports, the content uh, of esports. Um, right. And, you know, I think part of the reason is, um, you know, our, our children are not uh, consuming media the same way that, that we have. Uh, it's no longer like listening to baseball on the radio. It's, um, you know, people have their, um, their, uh, their iPhones, their tablets, and they're, they're on Twitch, they're on YouTube, watching their, their favorite, uh, their streamers and their players. And as that generation continues to grow up and continues to uh, uh, it, it, be engaged in the space and starting to earn money and starting to contribute in it in meaningful ways. Uh, I anticipate that it's going to continue to grow and explode. And it's a matter of um, looking for the opportunities now, looking for the needs now, and then finding the best way that, you know, the business can thrive with that. Fantastic. Um, and before we wrap up, what, what game do you play or games? Yeah, so there is a uh, there is a soft spot in my heart for uh, Heroes of the Storm. That's one of my favorite games of all time. It's uh, no longer really an esports uh, an esport, but um, back when it was, um, me and my friends uh, we had competed in uh, the DreamHack tournament for um, Heroes of the Storm, and we and we won second place. So there's all there's always a uh, fond spot in my heart for Heroes of the Storm. Terrific, that's great, and. Um, you know, since I'm a, a member of the eSports Bar, I'll certainly have other attorneys from the eSports Bar Association um, on my show because I think discussing um, legal issues in eSports is, um, it, you know, it's important because it, it definitely is a new area. And uh, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I really appreciate you being on the show today, AJ. Yeah, I, absolutely. I had a great time. It was a pleasure talking to you. And I, and I wish you all the best in um, your esports law career. And I know it's going to just um, uh, be terrific. Um, hey, thank you so much, Catherine. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Next week, my guest will be uh, Ricardo Gensch. We'll discuss the possibility of esports becoming an Olympic sport. Thank you very much. See you soon.